Okay. Wow, this microphone is really loud. Awesome. Welcome, everybody, to another Tor Talk. I'm Roger. This is Sylvia. Uh, and we're going to tell you about the Tor metrics, how to understand what's going on in the network, and uh, in general, how to grow the community uh, that we're going. So part of what I'm trying to do here uh, now, many of you have seen only me as a Tor speaker. I'd like to show you that there are other Tor people in the world who actually do things. And eventually, there will be more voices of Tor than just me, and maybe eventually, not even me. OK, so some motivation, some things to think about. Uh, here is a fellow who was elected in Iran back in 2009, but he ended up not in charge. And uh, many of you might remember the Green Party movement. So long ago, I was talking to a friend who was doing trainings of how to be safe in Iran, how to get around censorship. And he was teaching people open proxies, VPNs, Tor, uh, Siphon, other tools. And then he realized, everybody that I've taught anything other than Tor to is now dead or in jail. So I'm only going to teach Tor. And that was an eye-opening story when I heard it. And there are two lessons there that we take here. One of them is we really need to understand what's going on in the Tor network. So when a lot of users show up from certain countries, we know that it's happening. But also, we need to do it safely. We need to be aware of how we can measure things and understand things without putting users at risk. So we've got four main topics we're going to talk about today. The first one is introduction to Tor for the people who uh, need a refresher. And then we're going to talk more about the Relay community and who runs the Relays and how we grow that as a community. And then we're going to talk about uh, understanding what's going on with metrics and measurements and data sets. And at the end, we'll ask you to help us save the world. OK. Did I? Yes. OK. So. Tor is a lot of different things. Tor is a nonprofit. It's a free software project. It's a network of volunteers. So uh, raise your hand if any of the following apply to you. Uh, it, anybody here run a Tor relay or a bridge or Snowflake? Uh, anybody here help with research or uh, helping in like re writing research papers? Anybody here use Tor? Use Tor browser? Anybody here find themselves explaining to their relatives why I have nothing to hide makes no sense? Excellent. You're all part of Tor. Tor is an ecosystem of people trying to, trying to fix the fact that people uh, need privacy and not enough of them have it. OK, so I use the word anonymity when I'm talking to researchers, but really it comes down to communications metadata. And here's creepy NSA guy that we learned a lot more about from the Snowden documents. And he actually said, we kill people based on metadata. So that's, that's where we're starting from. And the goal of Tor is to protect that metadata uh, so that it's hard for people to tell uh, who's, who's doing what. So I only use the word anonymity talking to researchers. When I'm talking to my parents and grandparents, I work on privacy systems. Because anonymity, I don't know, that's kind of scary. But privacy is an important value. Everybody should have privacy. And then when I'm talking to corporations, Google, Walmart, and so on, I work on communication security. Because privacy is dead, anonymity, why would they want that? But of course they want security. And then when I'm talking to governments, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. And again, it's the same system, the same security properties. The goal is to get all these users together so you have your cancer survivors and your Egyptian activists and other groups all inside the same network. And then there's the fourth category that we've been thinking a lot about recently, which is the, the reachability side, the people in Vietnam who can't get to BBC, or uh, people trying to reach the Tor network even though sensors are trying to block it. So the goal here is to get all of these different groups into the same anonymity system so that they can blend together. Otherwise, uh, if you just had an anonymity system for cancer survivors, then people would know why, you're, why you installed it, why you're using it. OK, so how do you actually build one of these? How, how do you build a, a metadata, communications metadata privacy system? The easy answer is you have some centralized system, like a VPN, and all the users connect to it and request some web, web page or something. And a bunch of things can go wrong here. The first thing that can go wrong is, what if that central point of failure fails? 
Uh, so it, we hear this all the time. There's some new VPN company that says, we promise we won't uh, look at any of your traffic. Okay, actually, we, we do look at all of your traffic. We promise we won't log anything. Okay, actually, we do write all of it down. We promise we won't tell anybody. Oh, well, of course we answer subpoenas. And so the, the problem there is you don't know. It's a centralized system. They promise they won't screw you, but they have the data. They know you, they know what you do. They, it's privacy by promise. So, uh, and it's worse than that. Even if that centralized provider is somehow magically honest in all ways, it's still one point. And the cable goes in, the same cable comes out. And if you can get access to that, then you can start doing timing and volume analysis to say that user wanted to get that web page. So even if the central point is totally honest, it's still bad news. So the goal of Tor is to distribute the trust over multiple relays so there's no single point that knows both you and what you're doing. So it's privacy by design, privacy by architecture, rather than privacy by promise. And part of the goal is uh, we've got these you're able to see the slides, right? Even though they're not here? Okay, good. Uh, so part of the goal is that we've got these three relays and you build your path through the three relays and no single point in the network uh, is able to learn both who you are and what destinations you're going to. And another key point here, transparency for Tor is really important. Yes, it's open source, it's free software. Yes, we give you the design documents and the specifications and the research papers. Uh, and yes, we say, hi, I'm Roger. With Shisilvia, we're people, we're actually developers who are, are happy to, to publicly identify ourselves. And the, the key to that is transparency is really important. Every time I, I talk to somebody, they say, oh, ha, ha, the privacy people are talking about transparency. That doesn't make any sense. And the reason why it makes sense is privacy is about choice. Transparency is about choice. Our goal here is we choose to be transparent in order to build a stronger community, in order for people to be able to, to trust what we're doing and to become part of our community. Okay, so here's our first graph. Uh, this is a graph of the capacity and the load on the Tor network over the past 10 years. The green line is uh, what sort of capacity we have, and the purple line is the load on the network. And we're up at 250 gigabits per second of, uh, of, of actual load on the network, which is a, a pretty big global network at this point. On the other hand, the capacity has still been growing, and the, the purple line, the load line, has sort of flattened out over the past couple of years. So we can definitely talk about how to, how to scale and how the performance should work. Can you see me? Not yet. No? Oh. Keep, keep going? Uh, there you are. That's fine. Now it works? It did. Or does this? Hello, that's fine. Okay, um, so this is the number of relays per flags that we have. Flags are like roles that relay can have on the network. And for example, if we have a stable relay, that usually is going to be a guard as well, meaning that that's the relay that the Tor browser picks when entering the network. And some of you might notice there is an interesting curve here. It's um, the HS deer um, graph here. In the middle, we have 4,000 relays. And then sometimes around June, something happens, and we lose 2,000 of those relays. And why does that happen? So there was a Debian update. There was a library that had a few dependencies in common with Tor. Uh, so that up updated, and the Tor daemon restarted, and the relays lose the flag. And this introduces us to a topic that is important for the Tor network, which is diversity. And actually shows that we have a little bit of a monoculture issue when it comes to Tor relays. A lot of them done run Debian. And that is because the easiest way to run a Tor relays is you spin up a Debian machine, you install the package, and then you have the relay. And so it shows these monoculture issues, but you know, I think we're not the only one to have a monoculture issues. I think Microsoft said that we had, they had 8.5 million devices affected by the CrowdStrike incident. So <laughs> anyway, and this is why we talk about diversity a lot when we talk about the Tor network. Uh, the Tor network is driven by a diverse community of relay operators. And um, we have developers, we have privacy researchers, we have security professionals, we have academics. 
And diversity is not just a desirable attribute, but it's a critical component when we talk about the network. And you might wonder, what do we mean by diversity? Why we place so much emphasis on it? And what mechanism and we do have to foster this diverse community? So um, the first thing is when we talk about the network, we mean diversity of hardware, um, software configuration, location, but also of users. Um, hardware and software configuration, we saw a little bit when a lot of relays run the same operating system, they are affected maybe by a bug. That means a, a big part of the network is affected by the same bug. So um, we strive, our objective is to have a uniform distribution of operating systems. Uh, of course, we're not there, but that's what we aim for. Um, we place a lot of emphasis on location as well for a variety of reasons. We want um, um, third circuit to spread different geographical location because uh, it would make harder for an observer to place the, um, the origin and the destination of a communication. Uh, we want also to our relays to be spread globally to avoid single point of failure because if there is an issue locally that is affecting a number of relays, uh, we know that the rest of the network, we maintain the stability. And we also think that by having relay operators spread around the world, we have a more diverse community, diverse location, which in the end we hope maintain the network uh, growth and sustainability in the long run. And we also want diversity of users. So people use Tor for a variety of reasons. We estimate that we have 400,000 users daily in the United States. It means that we have diversity of usage patterns, profiles, interests. We have minority groups using Tor, uh, social right activists. We have privacy enthusiasts who do want to be followed by surveillance company where they surf the web. And for many people like um, activists, um, people belonging to different kind, for example, people researching, um, people researching, <laughs> people researching like um, information on reproductive rights online, people needed uh, um, looking for information on domestic violence, for example, Tor provides a platform to access information and to express themselves in environments where they could otherwise face persecution, discrimination and retaliation. So how do we actually foster um, this um, diverse community in a healthy way? So we place a lot of emphasis on direct communication. We use IRC, we use mailing lists, we use forum, we organize online and in-person meetups, online meetups for our community happen every month. We get feedback for, from relay operators, for example, and uh, we, get, uh, we tell them how, how, how development is going, if there is any update, uh, and we, we get this communication going on. We have in-person meetups, we are here at, we are here at DEF CON. Um, in Europe, we know that there are other events where people in our community like to gather. So, for example, we have FOSDEM, we have CCC. And we do develop transparent policies. Um, we have open process to create and maintain policies for a community, which are central to how we run the community. Um, this uh, discussion of how to propose and maintain this policy happen on our, on our back tracker on GitLab and everybody is welcome to, to give feedback. And it's a way for us to give uh, new tools to the Relay community because in the past we noticed that they were organizing informally and this is a tool to help them with, um, uh, with managing expectation and with governance. Testing, testing. Okay. Testing, testing, great. So where do these relays come from? Uh, originally, it was people that I had met at hacker conferences like this, and I said, Tor is really important, and you said, how can I help? And I convinced you to run a relay, and that worked great for the first 50 relays or 100 relays, but if we need to scale the network up to thousands of relays, and they need to be in diverse locations around the world, I can't go meet all of the people. In order to have a, an actually global safe network, we need to have them uh, everywhere and run by people that we don't know as well. And the challenge there, especially in the past few years, 
the set of reasons why bad people might want to set up relays has grown. We've ended up with uh, people in Russia setting up relays in order to do a man in the middle attacks on uh, on exit traffic. We've ended up we, we've seen people running relays a lot of them for reasons that we still don't quite understand what's going on. So this is a, a, an ongoing and growing challenge. How do we make sure that the Tor network has the relays that are doing it for the right reasons? And part of that, so, so how do we do that? How do we actually accomplish that? The first answer is we need to get rid of like application level vulnerabilities. For example, the reason why those Russian people could run uh, man in the middle attacks is because some Tor users were doing HTTP, not HTTPS. So we managed to fix the browser to do HTTPS by default always, and that is a, is a structural way to resolve that sort of attack. Uh, another angle to look at this, one of the few tools that we have in this community, the, in this social group of, of relays, is the social graph. It's who knows who. So if we as a community of relay operators get together and know each other, then we can be stronger against outsider or FBI people or whatever trying to come in and join. And speaking of that, one of the really successful models over the past 10 years or so is relay operator associations. These are nonprofits around the world who, these are individuals who banded together in their country. It, one of them exists in France, in Switzerland, in Germany, uh, there's one in Sweden, there was one in Luxembourg, there was one in Iceland, there are two in Canada. It's a global phenomenon where nonprofit like hacker spaces get together to run Tor exit relays. And one of the great things about this is it's sustainable, you can run really big relays. Another one is they can establish relationships with the local cops so they know how Tor works. Uh, and also we know who they are, we meet them at conferences conferences like DEF CON and grow that community. So having them be part of our community is one of the ways we can handle that asymmetry where we need to have a lot of relays around the world, but also we need to know uh, who they are and, uh, and have them work together. And speaking of that, EFF a year ago launched a campaign to get universities in particular running relays. And part of the reason for that is universities, that's where freedom of speech Freedom, freedom of thought is supposed to be, uh, but we, it's not just the, the, the freedom side. Universities are about education. You can run a relay at your university and, uh, and learn how to put a computer on the actual internet, which is uh, a, a thing that we all used to do, and now the cloud exists, so not as many people do that. So there's an education side, there's a community side, there's a research side. If you want to help do that, they have these amazing coins that they created a little while ago that I'll show you afterwards. Uh, that if you run a relay at your university, they will send you one of these amazing coins. And relay incentives in general is a, is a broad topic that we really need to work harder on. So gamification, like uh, Reddit style, Stack Exchange style, I got a gold badge for my five-year anniversary. I got a silver badge because I was an exit relay. I got a silver badge because I'm, I'm in a, an, an ISP that there aren't very many other relays in. So coming up with uh, ways to highlight what we need most and make people feel happy and part of a community and check out my gold badge, I can put this on Twitter. Uh, leaderboards, I'm running the 17th fastest tour relay in the world right now. So that's one piece. Another piece is just giving people more attention. Meetups, uh, having a, a time to answer their questions and walk people through how to run relays. And then there are the structural incentives. Like imagine we had a tour design where if you run a relay, you get better performance on tour. So there are a bunch of exciting security problems that come with a lot of these designs, but maybe there is a version of this design where we can uh, get rid of the security flaws while still keeping the incentives. And then the last topic is a lot of cryptocurrency people these days keep saying, you know what you need to do? You need an incentive coin thing so that people will want to run relays because they'll make money, they'll make you know bitcoins, dollars, and so on. And part of the challenge there is the cryptocurrency world, their fundamental building block is capitalism, is maximizing profit. And the Tor world, our fundamental building block is altruism. It's, I want to make the world a better place, I have extra resources, I can provide them. So these are uh, 
very different worlds in terms of organic, do you build an organic community of people who want to help each other, or are you just trying to everybody for themselves maximize your profit? And in that case, if you want to do it for profit, maybe you'll all go to the cheapest hosting provider so you can spend as little money as possible. Or maybe you'll sell your data on the side to make a little bit more money because capitalism means you know maximizing profit. So they, these are fundamentally uh, incompatible approaches to how to build a community of uh, volunteers around the world who are trying to keep people safe. Okay, so I want to tell you a bit about uh, network health and metrics and what we do. Uh, but first I want to tell you about a story because I want to put the, um, what we do in context. So um, uh, between May and June in 2020, we removed uh, a group of Tor exit relays that were doing an SSL strip attack. And we didn't spot this at first because they were uh, leaving all the exit traffic alone, but they were intercepting just a little bit of the traffic that was going to some cryptocurrency exchange websites. So what these were doing was that uh, if the user was, was visiting the HTTP website, not the GHTPS one, they wouldn't redirect the user, and if they wouldn't notice that there was not a lock, for example, in the browser, in the tab, they would just uh, continue to send their login information, for example, and this information would be intercepted. So we noticed this, we kicked the relays out, and then a few weeks later, in June, another group of relays does the same attack. And we notice again, and we kick them out, and then we realize that Network health is not just about kicking relays out, although that's important because you don't want malicious relay on the network, but it's a little bit more. Um, so we got together with the browser team and because of projects like HTTPS everywhere and a newer version of Firefox that allowed the browser to default to HTTPS and then fall back to HTTP just in, in when needed, we were able to enable HTTPS by default into our browser and protect our user, not just the network level, but also the application level. And so out of incidents like, like this, that we understood the value of having a network health team, which is basically joining together a group of people that keep track of the network. And part of what we do is kicking relays out of the network. So, um, but also part of what we do is community engagement, is working with the relay community, working, working with activists sometimes in the ground. And uh, the foundation of what we do also is collecting the metrics about the Tor network that gives an idea of how the network is performing, how the network is doing, and to understand if something is not right. And so when there is a geopolitical event, for example, we are able to spot it because we are able to notice some patterns on the network. And in this case, um, this is a picture of, it's a graph of directly connecting users from Russia in 20, between 2021 and 2022. And we start noticing that there was censorship being applied in Russia um, between November and December, which is a few months before the Ukraine invasion. And we saw directly connecting user decline. And as we saw this happening, we also were able to work with the anti-censorship team, uh, with activists on the ground, that we were able to tell the user to, to use bridges, and so we, we saw a spike in bridge users in Russia, and that meant that we were able to help these people reach the news and know what is happening outside the country. Yeah, so let me jump in and explain what a bridge is for those who don't know. We talk, we've been talking about relays so far. These are public Tor relays that are in the list, and that means that the sensors can get that list and block all of them. So bridges are relays that aren't in the list. Uh, so the goal is to transform the traffic in some way so that it's doing a protocol the sensors don't want to block, and it's talking to an IP address that the sensors don't think is Tor. So that, that's the, the arms race that we're in there. And there are a bunch of different approaches we have for bridges, one of which is? Yeah, and um, similar situation um, in Iran in 2022, the Masamini protest. So um, people, um, we started noticing that there was aggressive 
uh, censorship happening in the country. People were in the street protesting. They couldn't access the, the internet. They couldn't access the news. They couldn't use communication um, messaging systems. So by working with, again with people on the ground, the activists, the, pe the local people, and the anti-censorship team, we were able to um, teach these users how to use Snowflake. And uh, we saw how um, the, the users from Iran spiked during the protest. And for these people, you, reaching Tor was a lifeline in a way because they were able to communicate between one another in ways that it was not possible at the moment with any other tool. And if you're wondering what Snowflake is, so in the Tor ecosystem, Snowflake is what we call a pluggable transport. And it's, um, you can think of it like as a tool that Tor used to disguise the traffic. And in the case of Snowflake, uh, it used temporary run volunteer proxies. So it's um, by using the, the, the proxy, it's more difficult for the sensors to actually block them. And it helps people in very um, difficult situation to reach the internet. Yeah, so two things to point out for this graph in particular. One of them is that y-axis, we're talking 100,000 or maybe hundreds of thousands of people using Snowflake in Iran during that event. So as we're showing uh, more recent graphs, we end up with larger and larger numbers. We're talking about many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. And the other answer is snowflake.torproject.org. You too can volunteer as a Snowflake. You can either install it as a browser extension or there's a headless version for your Linux system based on Go. Please help. And so um, more recent case, we so just a few months ago, between May and June, uh, we, got, we started to see user spikes in Myanmar. And then we got news that the military junta and started to apply internet shutdown. So again, what we did was get together with the browser, the anti-censorship team, and help users um, connecting to Tor by distributing bridges directly for them uh, in the country. And we saw how from not having almost zero bridge users in the country, we got a spike in a few days to just half a thousand. Yeah, so one of the fascinating things about the graph like this, periodically we see spikes in our user graphs. And, and here we're like, wow, a whole lot of people from Myanmar just started using Tor over bridges. This is great. But sometimes we see the spikes and we don't know if it actually happened that way. We don't know what happened in the country. So every time we see a spike like this, we're wondering, is there a bug? Is there like a GOIP database mess up where actually these are people in Germany who got misclassified as being in Myanmar for that week? So part of the challenge we have is understanding what actually happened. And one of the principles that we have for that situation is trying to learn the same data points from a bunch of different dimensions, from a bunch of different angles, so that we can confirm that we're, what we're seeing actually really did happen. And part of that is angles including talking to people on the ground and saying, what just happened in your country? Why is it that we're seeing these graphs, uh, these changes in our graphs? Yeah, so we've been talking about user data, and you might have wonder. <laughs> That's loud. Okay. Yeah. I go on. Yeah, okay. I think they can hear us better than we can. Okay. So you might wonder, um, Tor is the anonymity network. How come you have user data? And so the simple answer to that is that we live by a principle that is we do not collect data that cannot be public. So all our data that we, we have in metrics is actually public data that we publish. Um, so we do not collect in client data. Um, our user data that we've been talking about are actual estimations, and I'm going to say how we do this. But other products, like VPN products, they actually count the users, and we, we don't. So what we have is aggregated data from relays. So. Um, uh, that our browser or our clients in general, when they connect to the network, they request a list of relays information and they need this to build the circuits. So we estimate that if, um, first of all, we count all these requests globally, how they are collected from relays, and then we estimate that if a Tor client was connected 24 hours, it will make 10 requests. 
So we count all the requests that we get from the relays when, when they upload the, the, their statistics and um, we divide them by 10 and we have the user estimation. So in reality we might be underestimating our user count by um, um, an order of magnitude but that's fine for us is the trade off that we want to make in order not to put our user at risk. So um, we, ha we do have though historical data and we, we, we actually serve this data on collector.project.org. You find all the documents that are ever I think been created on the network. And out of this data, we, we have network-wide statistics, and we have also the status of individual nodes that will give, we give us an idea of how the network is doing. And then what something that we do is uh, making the data accessible to the public, but also presenting the, doc the documentation of how we estimate the metrics that we have. And have we, we believe in algorithm transparency so that if you download these tarballs and you process this data, you can come up with the same results as we do. And if you don't, you explain to us why you don't have the same results and maybe we have to change something on our side. So this is an overview of how this process works. So the relays have this little piece of information that they upload to directory authorities, which are special nodes in the network. And there is a service that's called Collector or Collector, which downloads these doc documents and archives them. And then we have a service that takes all these documents, parse them, put them in a database, and extract time series and network statistics. And I said that all the data is public, and this is true, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, the first ex exception is that we are in a race with sensors. And these sensors have a lot of resources and sometimes we need to protect some of the data in order to keep up with this race. And the other uh, exception that we do is that sometimes we don't publish data when it can put user at risk. For example, if we have a specific country which has very few Tor users and we believe that publishing those numbers can help somebody else that has other data to anonymize those users so we don't publish that numbers. And I think the threshold is about 100 users. So um, we've been talking about metrics for understanding the status of the network, but also we have other metrics that helps us understand if a node is misbehaving and also give us um, an idea of how the network is performing from a point of view of performances and bandwidth and um, so on. So we look at traffic users patterns we have actual bandwidth measurements, and we have performance measurements. So one thing that we do is bandwidth probing, and uh, we have a service, so we actually have a bunch of services that are called bandwidth authorities, and what they do is that they create a two-hop circuit with the measured relay, connect to a web server, download the files, and gives us an idea of the time it takes to load, load, download that file, and we can compare this with the bandwidth that actually the relays declares and uh, when, uh, when they send their descriptors file to the directory authorities. And in certain cases we can find out in some relays, for example, is trying to game the system and tell us that they have more bandwidth than they actually do. And another thing that we do is performance measurements and we do them for two reasons. One of them is we want to know how the network performs from different points in the world, for example, um, we want to know how y the location of a user compared to the location of relays distribution globally affects uh, the, 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 the bandwidth, affect uh, other measurements. Um, and the other thing is that we want to know for censored regions um, how the network performs for, for those users in, in those extreme situations. So the way this works is that we have a Tor client and a web server and we build a server, a circuit directly to the web server, download again a file and we measure the bandwidth, we measure the time it takes to build the circuit and if there are errors for example. And so with all this data, um, we know it's open, we know it's accessible, we know everyone can start learning about Tor and it's, um, uh, it's 
it, basically it's documented, it's data, but we also know there is a learning curve. We also know that you need resources sometimes to, to store this data, you need time to parse it. Uh, and so um, we decided to um, open a little bit more the way people can access uh, metrics data. We are working on an API which is already in beta, it's already accessible. And we hope that this API can lower the barrier for researchers to start working with uh, metrics data. We have few endpoints available, more coming up soon as we are developing. So you can access that metrics-api.project.org, the two endpoints that are available are details and summary and give you some information of relays. I forgot to mention the API is called the Network Status API or NSA for, sh for short. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> one nice thing is that besides that you're querying the NSA to get the information is that um, it has a little bit more flexibility compared to parsing the data or what we were offering right now and is that you can do for example historical queries so there is a published variable that you can parse in the uh, in the URL and you parse uh, you send a date just year month day and then you get all the relays and bridges that were in the network within a week of the parser date so this is um, something new and that I believe can give a lot of uh, flexibility to researchers to start experimenting. I hope it, it helps relay operators checking the status of their nodes. And you can check out the documentation. We welcome feedback uh, and uh, bugs reports of course because uh, expect it to be broken. Um, and yeah, I think uh, it's part of the talk project mission to create and develop anonymity and privacy technology but also to further its understanding, scientific understanding, popular understanding and this is one step forward in that direction. Okay, so we've learned a bit about the relay community side when we've learned a bit about the metrics and network measurement side. What can you do to help us? So one big piece is get involved in the relay community and run a relay around the world at your university, at your work, uh, at your VPS, uh, wherever you happen to be. Maybe there are sysadmins in here right now who would love to add an extra relay on their, uh, on their volunteer rack. And so part of that is the more relays we have, the more performance we can handle, the more users we can give good performance to. And the other piece of it is the more relays we have run by good people, the smaller the impact is when some bad person shows up to try to run a relay. So the way that we dilute the, the people trying to do the attacks is we get more and more hacker spaces and individuals and hackers and, uh, and volunteers to be participating in this community. And yes, location matters. If you can run a relay that's not in Germany or the Netherlands, then you'll be uh, showing up in a part of the, the Tor network that, uh, that doesn't have as many relays right now. So for example, the US is nowhere near the top in terms of countries that are contributing to the Tor network. I hear the US has lots of hackers and lots of internet connections and lots of computers, so there's certainly a, a, an opportunity for you to help us make the US more impactful, which in turn makes performance better for users in this hemisphere. So think about diversity of location, but wherever you can run it is great. Please add more relays. And also I'm happy to chat with you more about exit policies and uh, whether, whether you'll end up in IP block lists and so on after this. And the other side of that is community.torproject.org has a lot of how-tos and guides on I want to set up a bridge on Debian, how do I do it? Here are the steps. I want to do a snowflake, here's the steps. I want to go to a relay operator meetup or learn about the relay associations, here are the, the lists and documentation. So there's a lot there and join the community in general, come to the relay operator meetups. We don't have a formal official relay operator meetup here at DEF CON this year because uh, this is one enormous room and we didn't figure out how to do the spaces. Maybe next year we'll join Privacy Village or something, but you can come talk to us afterwards and we'd love to chat with you more about relays. And if you can't run a relay, run a bridge or a snowflake or contribute in other ways. Yeah, so you can also get involved with the Network Health team. 
um, if you're interested in network data analysis, hunting for bad relays, there's certainly space for that. We hope the API can help you. There is also one thing that we do, which is uh, creating tools for relay operators. For example, Torweather, which gives a notification to operators when something is not right with the relay. But also, you can get involved with or uh, of different projects, the network status API, uh, the parser that we use to parse we used to parse the network documents in Java. And also we are trying to work on a better way to visualize um, network data. We, uh, we are trying to move the parser from Java to Rust. Uh, this, there is a the link to our wiki, please get involved. And if you are thinking to contribute to Tor in any possible way, um, you're helping me, you're helping Roger, you're helping our colleagues. Um, you're helping us fighting the good fight for privacy, anonymity, and internet freedom. Yeah, excellent. So we've told you a bit about how you can help us, but it's, it is about helping us, and it's also about helping all of the activists and people around the world, especially the people who don't have the power to uh, have a military or bodyguards or whatever, yet they want to change their society. So we will be doing an Ask Us Anything You Like at the tour booth in the vendor area right after this. We've got these cool badges and other things available. Or you can just ask us every possible tour question. We will be there until you have run out of all of your tour questions. And Argoon has kindly volunteered to escort all of us over there. And we'll hang out as long as you would like to answer all your questions. Thank you.